Hey everybody, I just wanted to make sure that you all know that below under show more you can find the document that goes along with this video. So feel free to click on the link and follow along if you desire. And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. Hey everyone, we are back to debunk our number one atheist warlock, Aaron Wrong, who will say anything, do anything, or study anything to combat the very God of the Bible that he hates so much. If Aaron thought for even a moment that if learning badminton would somehow disprove God, he would be in the Olympics for it. That is the level of hatred we are dealing with with this man. This level 10 warlock starts off the video showing an x-ray of a human and a chimp, exchanging out skull size and jaw size, giving the impression that if just this slight modification of the two things made chimps evolve into humans. I can do the same thing with cats. And dogs. See how enjoyable that was? Here's the most recent x-ray showing man's most recent common ancestor. Oh wait, that's just a pug. Okay. In all seriousness now, first, let's look at the placement of the foramen magnum. As you can see, both chimps and Australopithecus africanus have a vertically oriented orbital plane, with the foramen magnum at the back of the skull, which is inferiorly oriented for bipedal walking. In all primates, the foramen lies always well towards the back of the skull, with the spinal cord exiting at a slight angle, and the skull is more vertically oriented as we see in chimps in Australopithecus africanus. Yet, we see the exact opposite in comparison to humans, as full-time bipedalism requires that the cranium sets atop the spinal column, as the centered portion of the foramen magnum helps to balance the mass of the head above the vertebrae. If Sahelanthropus sagensis was a hominid which gave rise to humans via Australopithecines, as stated by multiple evolutionary storytellers, then the foramen magnum plane would have obviously changed over time to be more human-like in its placement in the Australopithecines, right? Of course, but as you can see, this is not the case. You can see it with your own eyes. The evidence shows the exact opposite of the story they're trying to tell you. And the foramen magnum is actually farther away from the center of the skull. So what? Evolution just decided to go the other direction, making a 180, and now having to go further forward to where it was before? This nonsense is exactly what you get with Spongebob evolutionism. It violates Occam's razor as well on every level. Now, let's look at this. Again, we see the exact opposite of what is required for evolution to work when we look at the orbital planes. Do you see the lines showing the angles of each skull? Well, at the top left, it shows you a supposedly early ancestor of man going back 7 million years ago, which gave rise to the one next to the skull to the right, Australopithecus africanus, which, as you know, supposedly gave rise to humans, the skull at the far top right. Now, did you notice anything about these orbitable planes? They go from a slight tilt in Sahelanthropus sagensis, and then it reverted backwards in Africanus to an even more primate state that is nearly identical to the chimpanzee angle today, proving that not only is Australopithecus not an ancestor to humans, but it never walked upright either, and it also falsified their own story about how one gave rise to the other in progression leading to modern humans. You see, 
it's not just about the placement of the foramen magnum. It's in conjunction with the orbital tilt as well because you can have a foramen location even in a different spot or even closer to the middle like a human. But when the skull is tested along with it and found to naturally be tilted, then it's obvious the animal spent its life holding its head in a position that helped it look up while walking on all fours as to not be facing the ground, just as the human angle is tilted a bit down to help us look forward as we walk so that we do not trip and fall. This is beyond obvious, but like most things evolutionists spew out and call education, it lacks showing you the whole picture. Because if it did and include these other aspects, it would falsify itself quickly. Human jaws have a parabolic shape, not seen in any ape, but Arn won't share that information. Both observation and logic dictate that the theory is 100% wrong. These are just more examples of blatant lies to the public to make it seem more true than it actually is. It shows how evolutionary science is a hindrance to actual science, which tries to falsify itself rather than hunt for evidence to prove the theory is true daily. If they were not so busy looking for the few similarities they could find, maybe they would have noticed the vast amount of differences that far outweigh it. My bet goes to the biased thinking that they use. Critics really need to stop getting mad at us for telling them that they were lied to, and then stop taking the liar's side when they are exposed. It shows their true indoctrination and cognitive dissonance. Here's another thing. No chimpanzee has a nasal bone. You can take a pair of sunglasses and place it on any chimpanzee or astrolopithecine skull or even supposed missing link ancestor to test if it's human. So keep this in mind. All humans have a nasal bone and chimps nor Australopithecus africanus do not. The second most important physical trait distinguishing modern humans from the other apes that are still around today is the size and shape of our jaws. It didn't matter that we had such little mouths and couldn't bite very hard because we were already relying on technology to hunt and to process our food before we eat it. The survey said... Aaron goes on to say that our jaw is weak and inferior to apes. Fail again right out the gate. The exact opposite is true once again. Humans have more bite force than any primate ever tested. Arn, how can you be so wrong so often and so much about everything you talk about? It's incredible. Literally, on your video on mutations, you were wrong on every single one. I've never seen anything like it. Now, let's look at our ancient, ancestral human counterparts, shall we? Wow, look at that. It looks like ancient man was far superior even compared to primate jaw thickness, size, and teeth as well, let alone modern day man. What are the odds that the evidence lines up exactly with our model and not evolution's? So much for that woo-woo theory of his. You would think he would actually research something before he makes a video on it and gets laughed at by all of us here. But oh well, I'm glad he doesn't because we love the material. Even though the teeth were smaller too, there wasn't always room for them. We didn't need the third molars anymore, but our genes are still trying to cram the same 32 teeth into a much reduced space. The survey said... He believes that wisdom teeth are vestigial and humans are evolving them away. First of all, they are not vestigial and it has been proven that they function and work just like all other molars. Matter of fact, dentists even state that they are a valuable asset to the mouth, opposed to what he's trying to say. Wisdom teeth only cause a problem because our diet has caused the majority of people's jaws to shrink. Since diet causes these epigenetic changes which affect our mouth, jaw, and teeth structure, then it is just more proof that it is not mutations nor evolution occurring, but rather nurture over nature an epigenetic adaptation never changes a gene, only the way genes are expressed. Long before epigenetics was ever considered, 
Western Andrew Price was a Canadian dentist who traveled the world studying and investigating the diets and nutrition habits of various cultures around the world to figure out what caused dental issues in some people but not others. He cataloged every major tribal group on earth and came to the conclusion that all dental issues were a product of diet from an early age. He discovered that to develop proper developmental facial and jaw structure and to avoid overcrowding of teeth and to not have wisdom tooth development issues, one must resort back to a natural diet off the land and avoid modern day processed foods. You can see from the pictures that not only did he include many twins and close family members like brothers and sisters in the studies, but directly showed what happens from generation to generation when diet changed or stayed the same, and also showed pictures of those well after their native diet was changed by industrialized diets and foods that were introduced. Dennis today still uses his work. He founded the Research Institute National Dentistry Association, which became the research section of the American Dental Association. natural selection would have eventually weeded out wisdom teeth and people with this Pax9 mutation would have eventually replaced us. <laughs> if you examine the inside of your mouth in a mirror to see just how ape-like your teeth actually are. <laughs> Skew that data, Oren. Skew that data. That shape affords just a bit of space above the tongue that other apes don't have. The roof of their mouths are relatively flat with their tongue pressed against it, which is one of the reasons they can't make anywhere near the range of sounds that we can. That and their mouths are also too deep to make the same noise as we do. The survey said... Uh, I've already talked to Arn about this. He has zero understanding about linguistics and has zero answers other than the Bow Wow theory to account for how human language arose. That theory is so easy to debunk that it can be shot down with simple logic. Here, let me explain it real quick to everybody. The Bow Wow theory says that humans learned language by mimicking the sounds of animals. So a cat should be called meow, a sheep would be called bah, a chicken would be <laughs> however the hell you spell that. <laughs> Notice anything? Nowhere on earth has any culture ever used the Bow Wow theory as part of their language. Nowhere is an animal called by any of those names, as far back as we can look at language. It's a dumb theory, and Arn Ra believes it. Next, he's completely wrong, yet again, no surprise, that the first in-depth study results on the subjects found that anatomically speaking, apes and monkeys are perfectly well equipped to speak like humans even compared to us. The simulated monkey voice sounded flat and gravelly, but the words were clear and comprehensible without question. They even share the same regions as humans in the brain responsible for speech, called Area 44 and F5. Forcing animals to talk through electrodes is not proof that one day they will learn language or evolve to do it. Lab experiments are a far cry from reality. Think about my friend's bird, for example. It can say many things. Is it ever going to evolve to use that ability? Never. What about the software? Because there are also genetic mutations that are expressed in the brain. 
For example, expression of the FOX2P gene underpins the skill of producing minute complex sonic fluctuations in songbirds as well as echolocation used in bats and verbal communication among humans. FOX2P doesn't just control the mental comprehension of what words mean, but more accurately, the skill of motor operation, synchronizing the movements of the jaw, lungs, tongue, throat, and mouth for the coordination of all these subtle movements required for fluent vocalization. Well, now that science has proven that this is true, then activating both FOXP2 genes and tweaking only two tiny changes in the sequence of the substitution of the two amino acids should now easily give primates the ability to use their vocals to speak. Since now that we know anatomically speaking they can, let's see what an expert who has done just that has to say about it. Wolfgang Ingard, who studies the evolutionary history of FOXP2 gene in Max Planck Institute in Germany, has come to the logical conclusion and assumed that since humans have two working copies of the FOXP2 gene, then that is what must be required for language acquisition for normal spoken language, if evolution is true. So, first, he studied 63 chimpanzees, 11 bonobos, 48 gorillas, 37 orangutans, and 2 gibbons to find which species had the closest match to humans. After obtaining the data, a year later his team altered the orangutans' FOXP2 genes because they already had one functionally working copy by substituting the two amino acids which make the human's gene different and then activating both copies of the new gene but the study was unable to obtain any results regarding speech or new communication skills. Simon Fisher, who was part of the team that discovered the original FOXP2 gene and the first to link it to language, concluded, There is no such thing as a gene for language. The study also lends weight to the idea that language didn't evolve from scratch, and he's correct. God taught Adam, and it's the only way language could possibly exist. Proven from over 300 years of observable tests, no one over the age of 13 has ever been able to learn language without acquiring L1 first. This leaves everybody over the age of 13 unable to contribute to the formation of language. Not only that, humans are the only species on the planet to have rosehip neurons. No primate does. But the question is, how can these recently discovered cells that make up over 10% of the neocortex, how could it have evolved is an evolutionist worst nightmare? The fact that it's only humans and has now been proven to be required for regulating the flow of information to certain parts of the brain and also how they interact with pyramidal neuron in the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus and the amygdala is just another example of how humans are nothing like apes whatsoever. They did notice, however, that harmful mutations, even in just one copy of the FOXP2 gene, had major implications such as severe motor speech disorder or differences in cognitive and generalized motor skills, while a mutation in both copies caused major brain and lung developmental issues. So while no benefit was seen by altering or activating these in primates, harm was seen by deactivating these genes looks like things are the way they are for a reason. FOXP2 was found to be functionally different in humans compared to all apes. Not only that, the gene is protected from change so much that they say it is highly constrained. So they had to come up with a rescuing device saying maybe it was under strong purifying selection. But they have no evidence for that either. So we already knew how to communicate way before we made up words where this sound now means that thing. <laughs> We're not the only monkeys to do that either. African vervet monkeys have uniquely distinct alarm calls specific to whether they're warning about the presence of a leopard or a snake or an eagle. Different species of monkeys have their own words for things too, or the concept of words, at least simple nouns, the basis of language evidently already existed maybe 10 million years before we invented verbs too. The survey said... Basic sounds are not language, Arn. Wolves don't have a language. They have basic communication skills. Fish don't have language. Apes don't have language. They have 
primitive communication skills. Get that? No professional linguist would ever say that wolves or apes possess a language, or that fish do, because non-humans do not communicate by using language. It's simple. To be classified as a formal language, grammar must be present. Wolves and dolphins and apes do not have grammar. Only humans have grammar. So all known fish, birds, primates, wolves cannot talk about yesterday or tomorrow or past activities or future activities. They can only make sounds about current events based on nouns. <coughs> only human children possess the ability to learn grammar for L1. Adults can take their knowledge of L1 and use translations to learn an L2, but no language-deprived adult can ever learn grammar without L1. If a person has been deprived of language for the first 13 years of their life, it's over. Speech is what made Homo sapient. Think about that. I have far more than you. And guess what? I have a video that I made that you obviously didn't watch, and a book to go with it, all free. Feel free to learn something sometime. Pick it up. Are we different to the animals? Yes, you can run this test too. Yeah, so we different. Yeah. So it well, no. We're exactly the same in every possible way. Are we different to the animals? Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. We're exactly the same in every possible way. And that proves my point.